Say It Loud Network presents Corner Table Talk. Good afternoon and welcome to Corner Table Talk. Today I am so honored and happy and can't wait to have a chance to talk with my, my brother Jackie Jackson. Just to for those for anybody on the planet that if it's at all possible that would not know who this handsome young man is. He's a member of the famous Jackson family. Over 100 million records sold. I mean, the, the sound, literally the soundtrack all of us listened to growing up, The Love You Save, ABC, I Want You Back, Who's Loving You, Dance, I mean, just just crazy on and on and on. And uh, Jackie has agreed to have a little chat with me today, and and um, I know he's kind of a low-key cat, but appreciate you coming on, man. How you doing, Jackie? I'm doing wonderful. Thank you, Brad, for having me. Thank you so much. Uh, my pleasure, man. My pleasure. So I'd like to kick things off, Jackie, just to kind of get rolling. And I do what I call the short order questions. And it's just kind of a little, you know, five questions that I ask, I fire mm -hmm. at you. And you just kind of give me your, your little quick response, if you would. What's your favorite meal, man? My favorite meal is seafood. Yeah, yeah, Any like particular seafood. kind? Lobster or? I just like all kinds. I like all kinds. Lobster, you name it. Uh, I like crab, crabfish. Last yeah, King, like crab, King crab. Yeah. I like yeah. it all. I, I really right. do. Yeah. So tell me, the coolest hotel that you've ever stayed in? The coolest hotel I've ever stayed in? Hold off Astoria. Really? Okay. Yeah. Waldorf, yeah. That would be kind of fly. Favorite guilty pleasure food? Do you have a sweet tooth? I love cookies. Oatmeal cookies. It's oatmeal my, cookies. It's my weakness. <laughs> <laughs> no chocolate chips? Oatmeal? No chocolate chips. You know. <laughs> All right. Delphonics or The Temptations? Now, these are two groups that I love, you know, you know, <laughs> I, know. I love both of them so much. But you know what? I, I got to say the Temptations. I have to go with the Temps on that one because we patterned ourselves after them, you know, when we were small. And uh, I, I say Temptations. Temptations. All right. Mm -hmm. Classic Adidas or Chuck Taylors? The classic Adidas. I'm an oh. Adidas person. Are you? Love, but I love Chuck, though. Everybody has some Chucks, though. They, they've kind of come back around, right? They still, yeah, they still back yeah. around right now. But I, I go with the classic Adidas. All right. So person past or present that you would most like to have a cocktail with? Sidney Poitier. Oh, good one. Yeah, good one. Sidney Poitier. I like that. Well, Jackie, welcome, man, and thank you uh, for doing this. You know, it's 2020 has been a uh, a crazy time to say the least. And, you know, we, we're here to kind of talk, bounce around on subjects and, and talk about hospitality, talk about restaurants. But I really want to kind of first get your take on, you know, how you felt this past year. I know you live in Las Vegas. Um, what's, what's the view like from, from Vegas, man? How, how are you feeling about what we've seen in the world, the election and in protests and pandemics? How, how are you feeling these days, man? Well, at the time when, when this took place, I was in Indonesia. We were doing a concert, my brothers and I. And um, and after I got home, like five days five days after we got home, that's when everything broke out. The whole pandemic thing, and and uh, uh, it was just devastating, man. I just from the ice view from Las Vegas, it's the same thing here. You know, it's the same thing all over the world, Brad. It's, mm -hmm. This is not just here in America. This is all over the world. This is taking place like this, and it's not getting even better. The issue of all kind of vaccines right now, but. But hopefully, you know, it's going to work. Like I told you, man, it's it's really serious out here. We have to we have to wear our masks. We have to mask up wherever we go, and uh, and try to stay with your family most if you can. Stay with your family. You, you got to do that. That's what we need to do. I know your mom. Your mom is in L.A., Jackie. Yeah, she's in L.A. Yeah. How's she doing, man? I know she's she's what? Oh, she, I, now, I right? spoke to. Yes. Yeah, well, she'll be ninety-one coming May fourth because our birthday is on the same day. Same day. May fourth. How's day. her spirits, man? How's how's her health? Her health is amazing. I mean, she sounds like she's just like 45 years old. You're talking to her. She's so <laughs> she's talking about the Lakers, how mad she was about them the other night. And, what? And she, how the Lakers are making her sick winning these games in overtime. She's, <laughs> she's, <laughs> she said, I'm about to, about to give me a heart attack. She said, <laughs> she, she don't miss a Laker game. She loves the Lakers, man. Let me tell you. She's doing oh, that's, wonderful. That's fantastic, she's, man. She's decorating I, I love the house. That. From new house over there, she just she's busy. She's staying busy, so she lives with my sister Reby. They stay together. Oh, okay. Reby. She yeah, keep, kind of keeps an eye on her. 
She's doing wonderful. Thank you. Oh, that's that's awesome, man. So, you know, I, I visited you a couple of years ago in, in Vegas, man. Your house is beautiful. I mean, it's you know, very tastefully done and live in a Thank fantastic you. area. You like Thank Vegas? You. Vegas a good you got I know you have a couple of young kids and a wife. Vegas yeah, good place for a family? I love Vegas. It's like a resort it's like resort living to me, you know. Um, you know, every time I come home, I just I feel I feel good coming here, you know, because it's, it's it's so scenic. You can play golf and you can kayak and you can do a lot of things. Ride your bikes and and so many Chris Tucker's right down the street for me and wow. and, and, Ed Griff, and Eddie Griffin. So we all get together, have fun. Oh, if you need a laugh, you got it covered. <laughs> Tell me about <laughs> do those Celine do those Dion. guys think you're funny? Yeah, they do. We we all funny. Celine Dion's two doors down from me too on the other side. You know, a lot of people in here. Yeah. Wow. So so Jackie, when you when you ride around Vegas, um, what's the scene look like there these days? Is is everything still shut down? The hotels, all the restaurants, everything still closed, or or what? Well, the hotels are like fifty percent capacity. You know, and um, things are pretty much still shut down. They're very careful who they bring in, you know what I'm saying? Because, you know, hotels are not packed like they normally are. Mm -hmm. But st people are still coming to Vegas. They're still doing vacations, but they're doing it on a light business, you know what I'm saying? Do you go to the Strip? Do you avoid the big hotels? Are you more an off-strip kind of guy? With when I go to the Strip, I just go because I like to see the lights and all the pageantry that takes place, you know. Sometimes I just take a ride down there just to get out, you know, but I don't get out of the car. You know, I I, I, I pretty much stay in the car, you know, just take mm -hmm. a ride down the street. Yeah. Because Vegas is just such a, it's such a great food town too, man. I mean, you have chefs from all over the world. All you over the world. The best, every, every hotel has great food. It's the best, the best eating you can eat is in Las Vegas. It's, it's, a, it's amazing, man. Place is something else, I'm telling you. So, th so does Jackie Jackson need to make a reservation when he goes out to eat? Or do you just roll up to the major D stand and they're like, oh, Jackie, Jackie. You know, sometimes I do, but most of the time I just roll up and let you in. <laughs> <laughs> you do, don't you? <laughs> There's some benefits to being Jackie yeah. Jackson, no question about it. <laughs> you know, I had a um, I had a bar in Las Vegas for about 15 years at the uh, the Venetian Hotel called V Bar. It was on the casino level there, and in Vegas? it just mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah, oh, I it was amazing to me, Jackie, because you know I come from New York originally, and just the, the round the clock nature of Vegas, man. It just, it yeah. never, I mean, talk about a city that never sleeps. Never Vegas sleeps. does not sleep. I know. It's it's beautiful place to come, man. You can have fun 24 hours a day, pretty much. Sometimes when I'm at home and I can't sleep, I just get up at two o'clock in the morning and just take a ride down the strip and, you know, just sightsee and take it, see who's coming, you know, at the time. <laughs> That was before the virus, but, but mm -hmm. you know, I just take a ride and see who's coming to town, you know, just mm -hmm. and then go back home. Are you a foodie, Jackie? Your wife a foodie? You guys like to go out she's to eat? Or? Yeah, well, well, she's a great cook, and sometimes we order in, you know, because of coronavirus, we might order in sometimes, and she's a great cook herself. But I love eating, man. You know, I pretty much watch what I eat. You know, I'm real careful with that, you know. As old you get, you know, you have to do that. You got to watch what you eat, what you put in your body. Last time I saw you and looking at you, you're in great shape, man. So obviously you're, you're doing that right. Do you, any so alcohol, are you, right? are you a wine drinker? or? Well, we got all, we got a big wine cellar and everything, but it's for looks. It's not for me. It's for people who comes over. I, I drink once in a while. I take a glass of wine once in a while, you know. Oh, what man. about green juice, man? You must drink something healthy because oh. you look about 40 years old. Yeah, I, I drink uh, I drink a lot of juices. I juice every day, just about. Yeah. Celery, what goes carrots, in your juice, Jackie? Celery, lemon, carrots, and I just drink it down, and a pinch of ginger, and they're with it. Nice, nice. Yeah. Yeah, that that sets you up pretty well. So yeah. I want to I want to go back a little bit to um your childhood, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, and I and from what I understand, man, you were a, a pretty serious athlete, and uh, you had a chance to kind of to kind of live a semblance of a normal life. I mean, you guys didn't really become the Jackson Five until you were what fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, somewhere in there. Yeah, yeah, somewhere around thirteen, around that, around that time, fourteen, fifteen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what? What? So baseball. I saw your, your your father. I saw a quote somewhere where your father said you were a really, really good athlete. What What was your sport, man? What was your main sport? Well, main sport was baseball. I played basketball too, but baseball was my main sport that I was really uh, talented in. 
when I thought I was on my way, you know, but yeah. uh, we, we played a lot of baseball because we had baseball fields behind our home and that's all we did. When mm-hmm. we weren't doing music, we were playing outside playing baseball, all of us. And I was a shortstop and a pitcher too as well. And I got some looks from Chicago White Sox and people like that. Seriously? Then we started, yeah. And we started singing. It's just something that, uh, first of all, let me go back a little bit because when mm-hmm. we started singing, we started singing with our mom first because our mom was a, was a country and western singer. She loved country and western music you know here's a here's this black lady liking country and western music you know <laughs> and my mom was seeing country and western music around the house so our television broke so we couldn't get it fixed right away so we start singing with her harmonizing with her singing this country and western music harmonizing with her all the time every time she sing we sing with her and uh, and i would go to the radio and listen to the basketball games on the radio and baseball games so the tv wasn't working you know what i'm saying and so we started singing so much, and my mom said, Joe, your boys can sing. He said, Kate, they really can't sing. He said, Joe, they can sing. You should check them out. <laughs> so he came over, and we started singing, and he couldn't believe it. He said, Katie, they really can. <laughs> he said, I told, you, yeah, I told you they can sing. So that's when he started going out buying us instruments. He started uh-huh. buying us instruments and things like that. And- Tell me a little bit. Give me a little flavor of what Gary was like back then, man. Gary, Indiana, where you guys yeah. grew up. Gary was this little town in Indiana in the wintertime, freezing cold in wintertime, mm. at summertime, raining a lot, just humid and hot. And uh, we were, at that time, we were doing a lot, a lot of talent shows around the town, uh, weddings, you name it, singing in the malls. We were doing school talent shows with with other singers like Denise Williams, because she's from Gary, Indiana. She was she was on those Niecy. shows with us. Denise, she was an amateur too at the time. Earth, Wind, and Fire, all them cats. We know all of them when they started from the very beginning. We ran into all of those cats. So we would do these talent shows all the time around town, rehearsing. My father would rehearse us because he bought the instruments. And Gary was this little town, you know, a little black chocolate city, Gary, Indiana. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and, and we lived right on the corner called Jackson Street. 2300 Jackson Street, right on the corner. This little, this little two bedroom house. This two bedroom house with nine kids. Whoa. With nine kids, this two bedroom house. And uh, it was fun. And uh, at our bedroom, like in one of the bedrooms, it was like four bump beds stacked on top of one another. You know, I slept at the bottom bunk. <laughs> and <that's just, laughs> and Reedy and Latoya, the girls, slept in the living room off the sofa bed couch. Damn. Yeah. Well, man, I, I'm an only child, so to me that sounds like fun. But I, I would mm-hmm. imagine it felt a little crowded. But that was what you knew, so it, I don't know that you had anything to compare it to, right? It's a beautiful love, a beautiful, a beautiful setting to us. The house is beautiful. We, we bonded together every day together, and we kept the house clean. We went outside, we played, we had fun, but we did our music. We do the music. We were serious about doing the music because we had concerts, I mean, show, not concerts, but shows to do around town. Mm-hmm. And so all the, all the kids would come around the windows and stand around the windows and peek around the windows just watch us perform. That was our audience. They would all be in the windows trying to, it was crowded around our house just to watch us perform. That was our audience at the time. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Wow. So Jackie, given that many people in the house, who, who, who did the cooking? My mom did the cooking. For my everybody? Mother, everybody. She was a great cook. She loved it. That's what she did. My father would work two jobs, and he would go to work early in the morning. She would get up with him at 4 in the morning, prepare for him. And I, he's outside taking the ice off his car. I remember those days, man. I mean, God, I, I mean, I don't know how he did it. Mm. And, uh, mm. yeah, and she's there cooking, and he made sure he got to work with a full belly, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, what would she make? Any Anything that stands out in your memory? Well, or? for breakfast, she made, there's no more breakfasts, but she can, my mom would cook anything, you name it. I mean, most of them did, that's what they did back in those days, you know? They mm-hmm. were great cooks back then, you know? Mm-hmm. They, they, they can cook. They really can. So things start to happen, needless to say. Not it, Your fan base started to grow a little bit beyond the, the neighbors yeah. peering in the windows and you guys mm-hmm. end up meeting Barry Gordy and, and Barry signs you and, and you start to, you know, start to become popular. You move to Los Angeles. So from right. Gary, Indiana to, to L.A., you're what, Jackie, at that point, 17 or so? Yeah, somewhere around there. 
and seven. What, what did that old. feel like, um, man, when you when you hit Los Angeles and the the, the and atmosphere of LA? I used to watch Los Angeles on television all the time during the football games. When I used to watch, you know, uh, Chicago Bears and 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 I was Cleveland Cleveland Browns, you know, it's it's snowing back in Gary, right? Mm -hmm. So so we played teams. Those teams would play teams like the Chargers and the LA Rams, right? So I see these people in the stands in shorts and blowing banners and <laughs> in the middle of January. Yeah, hey, man, we freezing over here. And I said, man, that's where I want to go. I don't know how to get there, but that's where I want to go. That's what I would say to myself all the I said, I'm going there someday. I don't know how I'm going to get there, but I'm go I will be there. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So we used to do all these talent shows, right? We went to talent shows and they would do weddings. We, we went in all of a sudden. We did a show for our mayor, Richard Gordon Hatcher. He's no longer with us today. He was the mayor at the time. Uh, so he was campaigning and he wanted us on the show. We played the show. What was on the show was Gladys Knight was on the show as well. And she she was on the show. We performed on the show. She saw us and went back and told Barry Gordy about the Jackson Five. So did, so did Bobby Taylor and the Vancouver's. They was on one of his shows too. They also went back and told Cheek and Chan, Bobby Taylor and them. They they also went back and told Barry Gordy about us in Gary, Indiana. And uh, next thing you know, Barry moves out to California because he wanted to get into the film business. He's he's leaving Detroit moves his whole office out to California to get into the film business. And that was great for us. So he sent for us. But when I got to California and I saw the palm trees and and then I could just couldn't believe people been living like this all their lives like this. <laughs> <laughs> I said, my God, they've been living like this. <laughs> no one told me about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. It was, oh my so, God. Was, so really, you're you're seventeen or so you Royce is going down the street, Ferraris and convertibles. And I said, look at this. Yeah. Pretty soon you were driving one of those Ferraris, but we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Yeah, so you're, what, a senior or so in high school? Did you yeah. go to Fairfax High? Is that? Yeah, Fairfax High School, yeah. We okay. Were we were at Fairfax High School, and uh, me and my brothers, and nobody knew we were there. You know, we would go to the recording studio. Wasn't even a block away, right on the corner of, of Fairfax. It's a recording studio. We go right over there and record all those songs. No mm -hmm. one knew it. But uh, we at Fairfax High School, and um, and uh, our driver would take us to drive into to school every morning in the van. And we see this guy in this uh, limousine pulling up all the time. Yeah, hey, what's this guy in the limousine coming to high school? He driving the limo, and it was. When it comes out to it, it was a hearse. That's what it was. <laughs> <laughs> kind of a limo. Yeah, yeah. But he still looks sharp getting out of it, you know. <laughs> so he gets out. He's tall and skinny, and he got this big old pike, like a like a pie comb, the fork kind of kind. You know, you cut cakes with cake or whatever it is. Oh yeah, we used on our yeah. afros, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. He had yeah. it stuck in his back pocket. Yeah, like that. <laughs> and he walked around, and, you know, real tall and skinny, getting out. He said, "Who's this guy?" Coming every day in this limo, so we got the met him, and it was John McClain, you know, John McClain. He was so cool, man, and uh, and, and he just he just had something about him, man. He just had that it factor. We just loved being around him, and he loved being around us too as well. And uh, he would tell us stuff like that. You're not going to sell out the form, you know. This uh, that, that's, that's a lot of people. He would tell us that. <laughs> yeah. He was just trying to lower your expectation. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We did, of course, but John yeah. McClain, all of a sudden he started working with uh, Soul Magazine. I'm trying to think of Gina Jones, Soul Magazine. Gina Jones, sure. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 he started working with them, man, doing work with them. And he gave them the idea to put individual issues on us. He, I mean, we were always on the cover, you know, as a group. But he gave them the idea that each brother have their own issue. And it was such a big hit. John mm -hmm. McClain came up with that idea. He's, he's, he's had some good ideas over the years, but you know, always, I want to go back to something that you said. You said that uh, at, at Fairfax High, nobody knew you were there. Well, that's not what I heard, brother, because the same person who we were just talking about would, told me how you were built like Adonis. And girls from surrounding high schools would come to Fairfax High just to get a look at Jackie Jackson. So somebody knew you were there. Yeah, yeah I was in the classroom. 
And I was pretty much like the only black kid in my class, you know. You know, it, it was like a Jewish school. Great school, though. We had fun. And there wasn't a whole lot of blacks there at the time, but I was the only one in my class. And so I remember this girl used to sit right behind me, and she used to pinch my butt off, just pinch, pinch it, like, <laughs> right? And I act like I didn't feel it, you know, because I was so shy. <laughs> So shy, I couldn't even turn around and say stop. I didn't want to say that. <laughs> Too shy. <laughs> Too shy, you know. And so I'm sitting there in the classroom, and all of a sudden, all these girls come through the door, the window, and start just screaming like crazy. We're going crazy, just screaming, you know. And they didn't come from, they, they, they didn't come from Fairfax. They came from L.A. High School, and um, they were screaming. I knew what was going on. They recognized me, and they were screaming outside. No one in the classroom knew what was going on. No, that the teacher, and they found out later that I was one of the brothers, one of the Jackson Five, and and it was all hell broke out then. It was like, <laughs> it was real crazy, you know. We had to go somewhere else, you know. Uh, but we we had a lot of fun, you know, a lot of fun. And our principal, his name was Jim Tunney or something like that. He was a referee on the weekends for football. He was the main referee for the football games. So, you know, one of the things that I've always heard about you, Jackie, is that you just always been that cat. You know, people just say, you know, Jackie has just always been that guy, but never, never on an ego trip. You know, as we like to say, just always kind of down to earth as much as you could be. Now, you've grown up, you know, being famous most of your life, but you do seem, man, pretty down to earth and pretty balanced. Do you feel that way? Yeah, I just couldn't be no other way, man. That's just me, you know. I'm the type of guy, I always told you, I like to go in the back door, you know. I just fit in with the crowd, you know. I, I'm not looking for attention. I've always been that way, and uh, that's just how I am, you know. The only, only attention I like is when I'm on the stage, and, uh, <laughs> you know, we're doing our thing. And most of my brothers are the same way. They're really quiet, you know. Janet, mm -hmm. the same way. Michael, when they hit the stage, you say, wow. That's the that's that guy, you know, because <laughs> he's, he's a different person on stage than he is off stage, you know. Yeah, you know, I was I was looking at some old videos of uh, of you guys when you first started performing uh, on television, and it wasn't the Ed Sullivan show; it was another one. But it was you were performing. I want you back. And I loved your outfit, by the way, man, with the frills and you know the everything yeah, else. The and, down, yeah, yeah, that's and that's you know the Delphonics too. and the Temptations yeah. with the moves yeah. and steps. But yeah. at the end of the at the end of I want you back, you go over to Michael and you shake his hand. And I thought that was an interesting thing to do to to shake his hand. You know, do you? Did, I probably don't remember that. But what what why why a handshake? You think at that at that moment. The reason why I shook his hand because he did such a wonderful job, and mm -hmm. and he wasn't feeling well that day. He wasn't feeling that well that day, and I told him that you did a wonderful job. I mean, oh, he tore man. it up. You know? Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, he wasn't. Okay. He, he, was, he was kind of ill a little bit that day. He didn't feel. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna I'm gonna share with you my my one story about your brother. So about Michael. Okay. So this was 1984, I think, and Thriller. Uh, was being celebrated at the Museum of Natural History in New York. And I had some friends in the music business. I was in the restaurant business at the time in New York. Uh -huh. And uh, I, I got invited to the event, and it was a celebration of the album, and it was packed. I mean, there might have been a 1,000 people there. And so uh, I'm feeling myself happy to be at you know, such a fancy event, you know, bouncing around, seeing this person, that person, and what have you. And Cindy Lauper was there, and I kind of felt like she was giving me the eyes, so it kind of made me feel like <laughs> I was feeling kind of hyped, you know. So yeah. I, go, Jackie, I go off, man, and I, I go to the restroom, right? Yeah. And as I'm coming out, I see like a bubble of people go by me, like 20 or 30 people, and they're obviously headed somewhere. And I'm a New York kid, man. I'm kind of slick, you know, so I I slide into yeah. that, that pocket of people. Right. Yeah. And, that, and I'm right in the middle of them now. And next thing I know, we're up on the second level in this VIP area. And there's your brother. And he's with Brooke Shields. And so people form a line of about 20 people to talk to uh -huh. everybody's getting there 30 seconds handshake and keep the line moving and i'm in the line and i'm thinking oh this is my chance i'm going to meet michael because i always felt like if you guys could only know me we would be friends right like yeah, every other right. black kid growing up in america right if they right, could just right. meet me man, i know where i'd hang out with the jacksons i know it, I know it. 
So, and I was getting my lines down. I was going to say, okay, Michael, you know, you guys got to come to my restaurant. Here's where it is, man. You come by after the thing and, you know, we'll hang it, whatever. Had all this stuff in my head. So I moved down through the line, man, and I get literally, I stick my hand out. And all of a sudden, a hand grabs mine and snatches me back. It was Bill Bray. And somehow he picked up the fact that I wasn't supposed to be there and snatched me out from my moment of getting ready to shake Michael's hand. <laughs> I was like, yeah. oh man, I was oh my God. God. You just let me. <laughs> I know. I'm supposed to be here. I could have had that moment. <laughs> no, that's funny. That's a funny story. Yeah, man, but it 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 didn't happen. But you're right so. there, right? right oh man, there. I was so close, man. I was so close. <laughs> didn't didn't happen. So when you when you got to L.A., Jackie, and started moving around socially, one of the other things, in fact, Regina Jones told me about this. Who said to tell you hello? Because I touched base with her before talking to you. She said you guys rented a house in Hollywood Hills, but you didn't have a swimming pool, and you used to have to go to Barry Gordy's house to swim. That's true. Tell me yeah, about that. It was on the Hollywood Hills. Hollywood Boulevard in the Hollywood Hills, the house we were renting at the time where we, at the same time we were recording. The monkeys live right there too, uh, right around the corner, but we see them driving by, waving to us all the time. And, and the Van Pattens, the one that played tennis, they was, they would come over all the time. Those were our friends at the time. And, and, uh, but we used to go to Barry Gordy's house, like he said, to go swimming. And he had this beautiful pool and, uh, who wouldn't, he had, you know, this amazing, beautiful place he had, you know, uh, we have so much fun over there, and uh, Dana Ross would come over, and and the Supremes and everybody. And uh, I like to give I like to give my prayers to Mary Wilson today. I knew her very well. Matter of fact, I saw her two years ago at Whole Foods supermarket. We were so happy to see each other here in Vegas, and uh, we talked for forty five minutes in the parking lot. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah, forty five minutes, and and she was she looked she looked beautiful. Still looks still look great. I mean, uh, I just can't believe that she's no longer with us. You know, so my condolences to her family. And but anyway, we would go there, and, and Mary Wilson would be there, and Donna Ross would be there. We go swimming and playing, and then Donna Ross would take us to her house, and and she had this beautiful house. Everything was all white inside, and and all of a sudden. She told us, moved everything out of the way and told us, let's throw paint on our walls. Down the Ross, yeah. <laughs> this is a true story. <laughs> throw her, paint yeah. on the wall? Yeah, paint. We were just throwing paint, just acting crazy, just throwing paint. She had a lot of money. She Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> or she just didn't want to hire painters and she didn't mind the splashy look. Yeah. Um, but speaking of Diana, Jackie, so you guys, uh, the, the, you and your brothers performed in Beverly Hills at an event she put together when you first got there at, at the Daisy nightclub or Daisy restaurant. Do you remember that night? Yeah, it was a Daisy club, some kind of party. She got, I'm just trying to think what kind of party it was, but it was a special party and, uh, and Barry Gordy invited all of his Hollywood friends and uh, producers and actors and you name it, writers and, they were all at this party. We performed, and we were doing things like that constantly, all the time. That's that's part of the business. You have to do that if you want to get, you know, pretty much recognized. You, you perform everywhere, mm -hmm. where you can. And uh, it was a great party. We we performed there, and uh, they loved it. And um, then not, there's another gig she did, one that did form at the time. I remember her stage was like in the center of the arena, and she brought us out. She introduced us to the crowd. See, Gladys Knight was the one who discovered us, but Barry Gordy took Dinah Ross, and he figured that I'm going to use my biggest star to get my young act over, and he used Dinah Ross to uh, introduce us to the world. Wow. That's what he did. That's, that's she's not really well known. I, I don't think that I've ever heard that it was actually Gladys that discovered you guys. Yeah, Gladys is the one who discovered us, Gladys Knight. Yeah, we talk about it all the time. We mm -hmm. always remember, and that's mm -hmm. true. Last night, and Bobby Taylor, the Vancouver's. Mm -hmm. Bobby Taylor. Mm -hmm. So, in in these early performances, the Forum, and even the the Daisy. I mean, did you feel it, Jackie? Did you know that you guys were, you know, something special? Did you did you know that that was what was happening? Well, you know, I never did look at ourselves like, you know, we got it. We, I, I said, guys, we got to keep working. I would always tell my brothers that, you know, and. No matter if we was winning the trophies at high school and things like that, and 
I know we had something going on, but we knew and we just kept working hard. We just didn't want to be little cute kids doing music. We wanted to be good. You know, mm-hmm. that's what we did. We wanted to be great at it. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? We're going to do it, do it right. You know what I'm saying? And I guess we were able to do that to get some recognition from people, you know, and uh, that's how it all started. You know, that Barry Gordy called us in. But let me tell you what really happened. The first time he had his party in Detroit at his house in, the, in Detroit, Michigan, on Grand Boulevard. And this place is huge, like a mansion. And this whole backyard is like a golf course. So he calls us, he sees us getting out and calls us over to the golf course. He says, if you get this ball in this hole, I'll give you $100. Well, $100 was, was a lot of money back then in the 60s. You know, <laughs> that's a lot of money. $100 is a lot of money today, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, so we tore up that, his whole green trying to get that ball in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so that evening, it was his birthday party. No, it was Dinah Ross's birthday party. It's evening. So he had this indoor swimming pool, bowling alley, pinball machine, everything. And so they set our equipment up around the pool, you know, around the pool. And um, I was getting nervous because I said, I said, guys, this is our big break. So the, my brothers were playing pinball machines. They were bowling. I said, guys, come on. We got to rehearse, man. This is our big break. We can't blow this. And Jermaine said, Jackie, don't worry. It's, it's going to be okay. Don't worry. And I was, you know, I'm the oldest. I'm, I'm getting right. all nervous. I said, right. this is our big break. We got to focus. Yeah, you got to focus, man. They run around playing games and having fun. <laughs> and I was getting butterflies in my stomach. <laughs> <laughs> this is very good, you know. <laughs> so uh, they set the equipment up around the pool, indoor pool. And uh, the next thing I know, people were coming in. I see Smokey Robinson. I see Gladys Knight. I see The Temptations. I see Stevie Wonder. I see Marvin Gaye. I see, and the only songs we knew was their songs back in the day, because Motown was huge mm-hmm. on, you know, huge on the radio. So we didn't have no original songs. We were singing Motown songs. Imagine singing their songs in front of them. That's what we had to do. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> and they were clapping and dealing with us. And next thing you know, two weeks after that, Barry put us in the studio. We were in the studio recording. That's how wow. it all happened. Wow, man. Now, I, I also read that they had a um, a charm school uh, at Motown. Were you guys? And But I wasn't sure if you had ever attended that. Was there? Did you did you attend the, the charm school there? We did, we did not attend the charm school in Detroit. But when they moved to Los Angeles, they had people around us charming us and Preparing us with to say in interviews and you know just just to prepare yourself. Yeah, we went through all of kind that. of like Motown, media training type yeah, stuff. Motown is like going to a school, man. They not only that they taught you about the studio recording, writing, and stuff like that. And there was always people helping you all the time. It was it's fun being there. I learned a lot from Motown. Great company. And so when when LA, you know, as as you started to feel a little bit of the momentum gaining in Los Angeles around, you know, you guys performing and and stuff, you know, how did you react to that as the as the oldest brother? I mean, your your view about what was happening to you guys was a little bit more of a mature view obviously than than your younger brothers, but did you did you say we we we're, we're, we're going to be big. This is really something special is happening here. Did you have a sense of that? Yeah, well, we were recording the record. You know, we were belief school. School was right around the corner from us. It goes to the recording studio, not far at all. It's called Don Costa Studios, recording studios. Not not even a block away from the school. We're recording a Want Your Back and all that stuff like that and all the songs. And and we knew right then it was a hit. I mean, we couldn't wait till it, come out, it came out. So when it came out on the radio, I was driving my car and all of a sudden, I pull off on the side of the road because after hearing it so many times in the studio, you know, on the radio is a whole different sound. Sure. It sounds so great on the radio. The whole. <laughs> I mean, when I heard it, man, I just couldn't believe it. I mean, they was playing, I turned to another station. They playing on this, this station, that station. That was just like a hit was a hit back in those days. You knew when the song was a hit back in the day. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And uh, we knew right away. That things things were changing right away. We we, we felt it, you know, because it was like pandemonium. Wherever we went, we couldn't go nowhere. I mean, it was like pandemonium. We were following. We can go anywhere. 
you know what I'm saying? And uh, that building, building, and uh, it was just, it was out of control. It really was. I mean, really out of control. Yeah. You know, it's interesting, Jackie, you, you talk about hearing, and you have heard other artists describe the moment when, you know, they hear their song you know, for the first time on the radio. But thinking about you, you know, back then, in what was that, 1969 or so? Yes, 69. Yeah. Right. There's no cell phone. You can't call your mom. Mom, yeah. we're on the radio. So you yeah. just have to kind of sit there and be in the moment, right? Right. Or tape it, or tape it on your little tape recorder you have in your hand. Right. You tape right. It. Yeah. Right. That's yeah. right. I used to make yeah. make tapes like that and try to, <laughs> try to pause <laughs> right. it before the announcer came back. <laughs> <laughs> I did the same thing too. I did the same thing. Yes, I did. <laughs> and I wouldn't always catch it, but you know, that was close. <laughs> when you you guys I think one of the, the first trips that you that you took was to Japan. Is that right? Overseas? Yeah. One of your first overseas trips? No, the first the first trip we took overseas, it, it was London. So we on the we on the plane going over to London, right? And um, right before we get ready to a land. It was five o'clock in the morning. The pilot gets on the on the intercom and he says, "The Jacksons are on the plane, and I just want you to know you got about ten thousand uh, fans sleeping in sleeping bags at the airport waiting for you to land." What? I said, ten thousand fans." <laughs> he says, "Yeah." He said, "Got ten thousand fans waiting for you guys." So we land. We walked to the airport. Fans were sleeping all in the airport, everywhere. It's like pandemonium. They were everywhere. I mean, they tore the airport up. I mean, it was a Heathrow airport at the time, yeah. And they were everywhere. I, I've never seen nothing like it in my life, you know. And uh, they were waiting for us to come over, you know, see Michael and the Jackson 5. And, you know, today with 24-hour news cycles and, you know, the information that already on our phones, it's like very little surprises us, we find. But... As you're as you're heading out of the country for the first time and you are headed to London, did you have any idea that you all were as big as you were when you were land when you were en route there? Did you were you shocked that ten thousand people would yeah. be waiting for yeah. you? Yeah, I was very shocked. We had no idea it was gonna be like that. We knew some people would be there, some fa uh, fans or and we knew that the shows that we were doing over there we, we would sell them out, but we didn't know it was gonna be like that. And we did not. It was, it was, uh, it's pandemonium. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, that's what it was. Mm -hmm. and, and I remember being there and, uh, fans are all outside the hotel room and all around the whole area. And then the Osmond brothers came over and they found out we were there. The Osmond brothers came over at the time and they tried to steal some of our thunder away from us. <laughs> 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 and uh, Donnie and uh, the whole Osmond brothers came over and they were trying to battle with us, but they couldn't. They, you know, it was, that, that was the Jackson. Tough, tough to hang with the Jacksons on, on that one. I, yeah. yeah, I feel for the Osmonds. So, Jackie, in the, the first world tour, as you're bouncing around the globe and, and, you know, momentum is just picking up and you guys are getting greeted like you're getting greeted and fans are waiting to see you. In reflecting on that now, the the music, of course, the the just how magnetic each of you were on stage. I mean, anytime the camera focused on any one of you, it was just, you know, you guys were just magic independently and together. But do you have any feelings about as you as you look back now and, and think, you know, music is just universal, man. And, and we made kids, we made people just feel good all over the world. And, and in some of those countries, they probably they didn't speak English, but something resonated, man. What, was it just the power of the music and the what, what, what was that? Well, that's what it was at the time. Because at the time, things were happening really bad around the 50s and 60s, too. You know, it was, and I, I felt that me and my brothers kind of bridged that gap a little bit. We brought here you got five teenagers and youngsters singing songs going number one for weeks on the charts not only in America but around the whole globe you mm. know it was taking place like that and uh, and it was bringing people together it seemed these little kids bringing the song we were singing was bringing people together as youngsters we were bringing people together and not only do we have young kids loving us we had adults liking the music uh, grandma, because it's the kind of music you can 
bring family around and enjoy and have a good time and sing and dance and just have, have fun time just listening to it. And also it has had that Motown drive that beat to it as well. And people just gravitated toward that music. They loved it around the world. It was a, at that time, it was a big hit. And uh, we started doing concerts around around the globe. And it was like pandemonium, the same way it was here in America, the same way over there. And um, uh, those were wonderful times back then. We really, really enjoyed those times. Those those yeah. those times you don't ever forget, you know. And still today when we go out, my brothers and I, they still come around. They're still out there. Even today we go to Europe. Uh, we have so many fans coming out to see us. And uh, uh, I remember this time in some parts of Spain we went to uh, last year. A lot of our fans, you'd be surprised. A lot of our doctors, lawyers, and CEOs of companies, and, and they're still with us. And they come to the concert, and, they, and we greet them after the concert, and, and they're in tears. He said, what took you so long? They say, what took you so long? And yeah. uh, they're in tears, and we're hugging, and all the brothers, and they're so happy to see us, you know. Yeah. You know, you did you did so much, man, to advance black culture, American culture. You know, the images of you all traveling around the world and just watching people just kind of lose their minds to your music and seeing them re reacting to black kids that way, you know, was a first. It it was and it really instilled, I think, a sense of of even maybe not even conscious pride. Maybe it was just subconscious pride for all of us who were cheering you on around the world, man. It was like a Jesse Owens victory every place you played, you know. Did you get a sense of the weight of what you were doing at the time or were you just going from one performance and trying to make sure that you had it together? And But were you, were you conscious of, of that you guys were, were making history? Yes, we knew it at the time. Once, once the ball got rolling, how it was going to be, and it's, you know, because we had the security around us, you know, and Barry Gordy and Motown made sure we had tight security around us, and and uh, it was like, you know, um, no one knew right away it was going to turn out like that, you know, but once you're out there and you see it, and uh, I just want to say, like, all the black kids are in Europe, around Europe, right? All right, brother. And oh, I told my brothers and I that they had no one to look up to. So when we came out, we gave them hope. The black kids in Europe, they would tell us that all the time when we travel. And that stuck with me still to this day, you know, when I hear it. When we came out, we gave them so much hope, something to look up to. And uh, they loved us for that. And, uh, and uh, we loved performing for them because it was really bad in Europe. A lot of people don't know back then for black people, for black kids. And we gave them a lot of something to look forward to. That's what they would tell us. And I, I saw it with my own eye. I remember being in Australia. We went to Australia to tour. It's like so many people around the hotel, a lot of white kids, but they would let the, uh, they would let the Aborigines in, in the hotel to see us. They kept them outside, little kid, Aboriginal kids. And my father said, there will be no concert if you don't let them in this hotel. That's what my father said. And my father went and opened the door and they all came in to see us and hug us. It was a, a moving moment at that time because that's something I, those things I don't forget, you know. I'm sorry, man, for breaking down like that. Jackie, was, please, man. I, I'm, I'm so moved and I'm sure anybody that listens to this is going to be because, you know, for those of us who, who loved you and your family, and whose words and lyrics we hung on to and sang at the top of our, I mean, I could sing every part of every song. I could sing your part, Michael's part, Jermaine's part, sing everybody's part, you know. <laughs> but it was so much more than that, man, because you mm -hmm. really did represent um, something to young folks, man, that, that we had really, we hadn't seen before. And to watch you go around the world and all you so beautiful and handsome and smart and articulate and, and proud and, and just, I, I, it just so resonates with me, man, how you, you know, talking about the Aborigine kids and your dad taking a stand and the kids in Europe, the black kids in Europe and how moved um, they, they must have been to have seen you. And I just want to tell you, man, that you, you know, you and your family have impacted, I'll speak personally, you've impacted me in that way, man. And, and, um, uh, just so grateful for everything that, uh, that you guys have brought to the world and your spirit. Well, that's what we try to, um, instill in our music 
And the kind of music we were recording in the studio, we just didn't want it to sell just in America. We wanted to sell the music around the world. We tried to impact the people around the world, the message and the music, the kind of friendly music we did. We wanted everyone to hear it and listen and enjoy the music. And uh, we happened to have hit records at the same time doing that. And uh, that's what sparked this whole thing together. And uh, our performance as well, because when we did perform, we, we tried to get great performance every time we got on the stage of the brothers and give them a show. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, because people said, thought they were cute or they're small enough guys, we really want to put on the show. You know? And we did. We managed to do that, you know, mm -hmm. with all the people helping us. And, and uh, I wouldn't trade my life for nothing in the world, things that I've learned in this industry and in, in the music industry, because it taught me so much, you know, about the world and seeing the world, performing for the Queen twice, of England twice, you know, and talking to her because I would read about her in the history books of England and, and meeting her and she telling us, she's naming our records that we got and she have all our records and stuff like that. <laughs> and, uh, I couldn't believe it. And then we performed and she calls us back a second time. We did it a second time for her. And so we've done a lot of wonderful things over the years, me and my brothers. It's, it's, it's been a great ride. I went trade for nothing in the world. It's been wonderful. Yeah, that's beautiful, man. You know, so much these days, you know, and and not to overgeneralize a particular group of people, but it seems we're, you know, we're certainly hope maybe even emerging out of a, a real me culture, you know, social media, reality TV. Yeah. Again, you know, we're, our phones are everywhere we go. And, you know, the information age is just constantly bombarding us. And, and it seems that there's a, you know, among some, there's a, the objective is to be famous, not necessarily to be known for something that, you know, you get certain recognition for, but fame as an ultimate goal. You guys were, were incredibly talented and are incredibly talented. Was fame ever something that you sought that you felt, oh, I, I, I want to be famous. That's, that's what I want. No, well, we didn't think that way. We just wanted to do music. We just had a, you could have paid us nothing. We could have performed on stage and get paid nothing. That's how bad we loved be performing on stage at that time. We were so young. We we didn't care about the money. It wasn't about fame. We just wanted to perform in front of people. And uh, that's all we knew how to do. We loved doing that. You know, performing was, was something that when my father first told us that we had to do a concert, he said, you got to do a concert. That means you got to play for two hours. <laughs> he said, I said, two hours? How are we going to do that? <laughs> When he first told us that, I, I, I'll never forget those days he told us that. Uh, what, you didn't think you had enough material to play for two hours? Or? How are we going to sing for two hours? You know, <laughs> I know we had enough material. It was time to go do it. But I said, how are you going to do that for two hours? Who's going to help us put the show together? We put the show together ourselves. And with Suzanne the Past came and helping us with the show. We, Suzanne the Past, me and the brother, we put the show and the concert together ourselves. Do you talk with your kids at all about the influences of social media and do you make sure that they kind of regulate how much time they spend on their phones or online? Or what's, what's your approach with that, Jackie? They're, my boys, they're growing up in this era of social media. They know everything about it. They know how to work it better than I can. He's seven years old, they're twins. And they're, they, they know everything about the Jacksons, everything about Jen, everything about Justin Bieber. They, they know everything. But, but my wife watches them. She keeps an eye on them when it comes to other stuff. You know, she keeps a close watch. But they're so smart. I guess all of these kids growing up in this era like that. It takes away from your privacy sometimes. It invades your privacy sometimes, social media, to me, sometimes, you know. And sometimes, you know, I don't want to be found. I, I, I don't want to carry my phone. I just leave it at home, man. I, I don't want it with me, you know, today. You know, sometimes I have to get away from it. I really do. But sometimes I need it. It's good. It's, it's, you learn so much off of it, man. It helps you a lot, you know. But it can be devastating, too, at the same time. Yeah. It's like a, it's a double the all the uh, double A so all the crazy yeah. stuff you see on all the stuff it, like you say everybody's trying to be famous everybody's trying to be a star. Mm -hmm. Everybody, you know, it's good to think that way, but be normal, mm -hmm. be you. <laughs> you know? Can you um can you go out to eat, Jackie, and be left alone? Do do you do people see you and immediately <laughs> rush up to you and interrupt you and your wife and a lovely dinner yeah. and want an autograph or a picture? Or? You know, and they come up nicely and. Uh, mm -hmm. And I sign, yeah, I do. They they still come up and I sign nicely. 
they're very polite when they come up, you know. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I, I don't mind. I really don't. I, I've never turned down an autograph, never in my life. So back to to your kids. You have two young boys, right? Yeah. The twins. Yeah. Jalen and River. Yeah. Jalen and River. Yeah. When you watched the events of 2020 and the protests around George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and you know the like, and you have I'm a I'm a father. My son is 30, and uh, you know I I have tried to have conversations with him about you know what to do if you get pulled over, and you know just you worry as a dad, as a parent, yeah. especially a parent of, of black kids. Do you, have you found yourself having to have those kinds of conversations with your boys? Well, my boys are so educated on that. When all that stuff is taking place, they was watching it at the same time. They would come and tell me about it. They, they're aware of what's, who they are and what happened and, and, and why did the police would shoot them like that. And, and, the, and, and I've told them that you, you just have to, get, when you get pulled over, you just have to do everything they tell you to do. Don't sassy. Don't say anything. Don't say nothing back to them. Just do everything that and you want to reach for something. I said, I said, you have to let them know your driver's license or, 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 or your uh, registration insurance is over here. Can I get it? I mean, cause you can reach and they can shoot. You know what I'm saying? And you just have to be really careful, man, today. I mean, I got pulled over last week the same way. Because I was in a fancy car, and uh, and he just pulled me over, and I said I wasn't speeding. He said I knew who you were. I just wanted to say hello to you. That's what he what? said. To me. <laughs> <laughs> he, just, he just wanted to say hello to me. It scared Forget me. Forget about what he, he just did to your blood pressure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he scared me. Hard. <laughs> yeah, he just went well, to me and said, "Keep up the great work." He said, "I admire you guys." Great job. He was nice. This is a white policeman. He was very mm -hmm. nice. He scared the hell out of me. He really did. <laughs> well, at least that's a happy story, man. Yeah, it's a happy story, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but like you said, you have to be really careful out here today. You really do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you, um, Jackie, are you spiritual? No, not. You know, I, I don't go to a church or anything like that, but I just try to do the right thing, you know. I believe in the Lord and everything like that, but... I'm not a real spiritual guy, no. Are you are you optimistic about life in general? About you have days where you are you are you happy most days? Yeah, I mean, Brad, you know, I, I'll tell you, man. As long as I got a roof over my head and and I'm eating, I'm okay, and I got my children, my family with me, I'm fine, man. You know, yeah, I'm happy. You know, my my friends and I that are about the same age, we're we're in our sixties now. We we refer to this period as the fourth quarter, right? right. Yeah, and, yeah. And you know, we we spend a lot of time reminiscing and and remembering things from the mm -hmm. past and joking around. But you know, we we also commiserate, and it's just good to have you know friends to exchange you know laughs with and you mentioned Chris Tucker and those guys you you have a group of friends man that you can hang with and have conversations mm -hmm. with and 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 yeah. just kick Chris, it yeah Chris, Chris Tucker John McClain uh John Nettlesby and and Eddie Griffin who lives around here and yeah I have friends I can call and talk to and just mm -hmm. Dr. Glenn you, Bobby yeah do you place importance on on friendships friendships important to you Right now it is, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but um, I'm, you know, I have a small stable of friends. I don't, I don't have a. I like certain people. I just like to hang with. You know what I'm saying, Brad? You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not a lot of people. You know. So, um, as I mentioned, Jackie, you, you know, you look like somebody who really takes good care of yourself, man. You working out these days? What do you do for exercise, man? Well, lately I've been going to therapy for the last six months. Because I had mm -hmm. um, a rotator, turn rotator cuff in my shoulder, and I had it operated on, you know, during the pandemic. And uh, they're almost three days out of a week, and it's, getting, it's like 85% or 90% right now, mm -hmm. and it's getting stronger every day. But I work out there, you know, with them working me out at the same time. I take four-mile walks every day in the neighborhood, too, as well, you know. Mm -hmm. Healthy nights. diet? Do you eat pretty well? Yeah, I, I eat pretty well. Stay. I, I like to eat fish, asparagus, broccoli, salads. I keep it like that. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Chicken. You know what I'm saying? And once, you, in a, once in a while, you might splurge. You know what I'm saying? What would that be? 
I might go get some uh, In and Out burger or something like that. Because <laughs> yeah. the boys want it. The boys want to go to In and Out, you know. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And I'll, I'll splurge with them once in a while with them. Nice man. Yeah. And um, musically, Jackie, what what do you listen to these days, man? Anything that inspires you? That uh, any of the young artists or old artists, for that matter, that uh, are in rotation yeah, on your playlist? I listen to it all. Uh, even some of the kids I hear today, Bruno Mars, and even Justin Bieber. I like his stuff, and I like Beyonce, and you know, with they, with the, when she puts out. And I listen to it all. I really like it all. Yeah. A little Drake sometimes, you know. Yeah, check mm-hmm. out Drake, you know. I like Drake. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All the cats, you know. Yeah. I love Buster Rhymes, you know. He's the face. I love Buster Rhymes. Love Buster Rhymes. Yeah, yeah, I found myself listening to a lot of old music this past uh, the past year with everything going on. You know, just I mean, uh, as many times as I've listened to Marvin Gaye's "What's Going On" album, man, it just yeah. seemed like he was singing about mm-hmm. today. Yeah, Marvin Gaye, isn't he? He had his time, right? Yeah, man. What's going on today? Yeah, just amazing. Do you think that given what we've just been through and we're still going through and hopefully the vaccine people, you know, at some point when everybody feels safe starts to take it and we we get past this pandemic. But, you know, it's had an effect on on our psyche, certainly on businesses, uh, restaurants in particular, you know, closing and and not being able to have folks uh, come in to eat. Do you think that restaurants are going to recover? Do you think that people are going to be anxious to go back out again? Or do you think that it's folks are going to be hesitant to be in crowded rooms? Uh, you know, Brad, I really don't know at this particular time. Uh, I just know that uh, there are more people out, you know, than usual. You know, people still coming out. I don't know whether it's a safe thing to come out like they're doing. Or some of them not masking up. You know, a lot of them they're out here and they're not putting the mask up. There's nothing wrong with coming out, but please put your mask on. They're not doing that. A lot of people are not doing that. And a lot of the younger kids are not doing that. Let's say from the age from 20 to 40, uh, 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 people are catching the coronavirus from the age from 20 to 40. It's with the younger generation right now. So, you know, we we have to be careful out here. That there's a lot of businesses that have been lost this year. I mean, so many. I mean, black businesses, too, and, and white businesses because of the virus and the I really feel for these people because I know exactly what they're going to. Even through, for us as entertainers, we can't even go out there and perform today, right now. We have to wait and see what's going to happen. What kind of changes that are going to be made for us to go out there and, and do a safe concert and have bring the people in safe as well. But I, I see they're trying to say that we all have to be vaccinated in order to go see a concert or to go see a football game or basketball. Game. Uh, they want to make sure you, you had your shots. And maybe they might do it that way. That's what I'm thinking. You know, so still waiting myself. But, uh, I'm still waiting. I'm not going to rush into it right away. But I'm, I'm sure it's something we all have to do. You know what I'm saying? I don't know when I'm going to be in line for the vaccine, but I certainly am anxious to uh, to take it in and hopefully <laughs> be able to move beyond, you know, this, yeah. this uh, um, kind of isolated and, and, you know, just staying home. You know, I'm, yeah. I want to get back out in the world a little bit and, and move yeah, around. Yeah, you got to get out a little bit, you know. Yeah. You do. You have to, I, sometimes I get out and just take long drives in the desert, you know, just in my Jeep that I have a, a Jeep my father gave me, you know, in the and I love it because when I get in the chief, it smells like him. I smell him in there. You know, I really do. <laughs> yeah, I got his scent in there, and I love driving it, man. I love driving the chief, and he fixed it all up and everything. But he never took it off road anywhere. He got it all fixed up, and all up in the air and everything. He got everything on there you can have, and he's never took it off road. And I love driving it. I just because you can just park it anywhere, just do what you want to in it. You know what I'm saying? I love it. I just get out and just drive, man. Just. Just to get out of the house sometime, you know. Yeah, you it's funny. The, the the car has really been like a great safe space, right? You can get in your car and be in your own environment, be safe, and just go. Just go, man. Just yeah. go. Look. Yeah. Well, Jackie, you know, I I so appreciate you taking some time, man, to, to to join me here in this in this podcast. It's great talking to you, man, and I wish you and your family all the best. Stay safe, stay healthy, man. Much continued health and and blessings and best wishes to you brother thank you so thank much you. for joining me today and thank you brad next time i get all the other brothers with me i have them on here with us and we 
when we talk some smack. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to book that date. My man, thank you. thank you, brother. I appreciate it, thank man. Thank you. Welcome, Ambassador Shabazz. I hope you're having a, a lovely day. What's what's new in your world? What do you well, want to you talk know, about today? You and I always talk about the fact that I just move around the globe quite a bit. And generally, I actually accrue about 100,000 air miles. And only now I'm accruing those miles through technology, conversations, virtual conversations with people that are doing amazing things. And, you know, while I was never a fast food eater, I'm a connoisseur of good food fast, but it has to be, you know, flavorful and healthy and clean. And so we're all watching this plant-based food product populate all kinds of unique ways of digesting culinary beverages and food and so well, whether it's to your uh, point burger king has the impossible burger hello and i was going to mention the impossible burger you know i mean the first time i dove into it i had to like stop and ask is this real is it not and you, then you look at everyone else around the restaurant they do the same thing like is this is <laughs> really meat this tastes like meat so the fact that we can have plant-based food in a way that you can trust the ingredients right the preparations. And there's so many people, whether you're kosher like I am, or people who are indeed vegetarian or vegan, it's great to be able to dine with everyone and have all the flavors. And so whether you are uh, Kaya, you know, of Chobani, who didn't stop at yogurt, but is now making all kinds of plant-based products, the Impossible Burger. I've just finished speaking to the founders or creators of Zyko the coconut water, and they just took their drink back from, they just bought it back from Coca-Cola. So I'm due to speak to her um, at length in about two weeks. And so I'll update you on that. But in the meantime, you have uh, young brothers and sisters who are suddenly diving into this medium, this business forum. So one of the amazing conversations I've had in the last week, you know, um, is with Stephen Smith. He's a brother based in Florida, and he has a company. He's the CEO of a company called Vegan Fine Brands. We chased each other for a while trying to zero in on this conversation and Zoom enable us to kind of, again, hug in person and talk about sharing this food sector that he's been a vegan himself for 20 years. And people don't always associate that to people of color, you know, and that he finally came out with not just the brand and singular, but the plural of what that brings. It's a vegan fine cafe. It's a restaurant. Uh, fresh foods, vegan body, which is about the care and vitamins. And then there's also the franchise model. And what he said to me about that is that most of his franchisees are young, young VCs, families sustaining a, a, a business. So what's exciting to me is that these are young people of color, but not singularly, who are interested in health and lifestyle and preservation. And most of those are now in Atlanta and Baltimore. And in uh, he's, his primary spots are there in Florida. He's in Boca Raton, Fort Lauderdale, and Miami. Let me take a step back. So so he is in the brick and mortar business now. You're saying that he's he, in the has, brick and mortar he has business established at, these yes. venues around. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly right. He has three different channels right now. That's the vegan body here. And that includes all of the the facials, the vitamins, it's the wellness of the body. And you can go zero in on that part of the franchise singularly. Then there's the uh, restaurant, live, walk in, sit down, dine, and enjoy good food, healthy food, as well as the, um, the grocery store. That was another model. So my conversation with him spun other arteries, you know, because... If I can't get to him and I'm not ready to franchise, can he do gift models, gift packages so that I can have a sample pack the same way you do with Harry and David or sure. any of those kinds of things? So we've talked about that. So he's putting some of those together because I am eager to be involved. Interesting. Um, is there a website that you can? Yes, there is. And it's that simple. It's veganfinebrands.com. And if you go on to business, um, you'll see all the different franchise breakouts or the collective. I know that, you know, I'm eager, not just because I need a business venture, but because I am one of those healthy consumers. 
you know, I'm a homeopathic kind of person. I'm curious about the vitamins and what they use. And, but I like the fact that it's also tasty. You know, I'm a soul food sister, but it just has to be kosher. Well, you know, we, we've touched on this before, but uh, vegan soul food or vegan diet even is one of the fastest growing That's trends right. among African-American millennials. So I would love to have uh, Stephen Smith on the show and, and dive deeper into this with him. It sounds like a, a really fascinating endeavor. Well, and I encouraged him. He was excited. I said to him, I can't wait for you to come on to the Corner Table Talk and to share this. I'm excited. You could hear it in my voice because I know it's a space for me. And when he talked about the millennials and, and the families that are setting up shop, I thought, great. It serves many purposes. Well, fantastic. Well, I, I look forward to that. And uh, I look forward to be, being able to see you soon and enjoying an impossible burger somewhere uh, on a very <laughs> healthy fine bun. Brand. <laughs> on a vegan fine brands. Yes. Well, Ambassador Shabazz, thank you very much. And thank you, my uh, all dear. My best. Bye-bye. Corner Table Talk is hosted by Brad Johnson. Produced by Brad and Linda Ailes Johnson. Coordinating producer, Lauren Turner. Theme music, Life Goes On by Bryce Vine. Executive producers Omar Thompson, Andrew Kalb, and Ken Johnson. Find the Corner Table Talk podcast wherever you get your podcast. Follow, subscribe, rate, and leave a comment. Corner Table Talk is a Say It Loud Network production.